Hello, third grade, and welcome to unit two, week four of language arts. I'm going to go over your vocabulary words with you first. Our first word is the word population. So population is the amount of people or animals that are living in a place. So you can say the population of San Diego might have a few million people in it, or the population of puppies, um, or the population of, for example, animals in the zoo, where you're talking about the amount or how many of them are living in that particular place. Your next word is the word caretakers. Now caretakers are people who look after, um, <clears throat> who look after things or people or animals in a particular area. So the caretakers are the people who, like the word says, take care of the living things. Your next word is the word recognize, and recognize means when you remember um, something that you had seen before. So when you see something that you had seen previously, like you go to a place that you haven't been to in a long time and you recognize it because you see it and you're like, oh, I remember when we came here before, or you might recognize somebody that you've seen in the past or an old classmate when you see them outside of school. So recognize means when you're remembering something that you had seen or interacted with in the past. Your next word is the word relatives. Now relatives are people or animals that are part of the same family. So they're related uh, in some way. They can be close relatives like you are with your mom or dad or brothers or sisters, or they could be far relatives like grandparents, uncles, uh, and things like that. Animals also have relatives. So in, in the animal kingdom, we have certain animals that are relatives or they're related to other animals because they share the same qualities, like dogs are relatives of wolves. Your next word is the word success. So when something is a success, that means it turned out well. It went the way that you wanted it to. Uh, so you can say, uh, I, we practiced hard for our soccer game and it was a success. We won our soccer game. Your next word is the word survive. So when something uh, is trying to survive, it's trying to stay alive. That's, that's the simplest meaning for it. So you can say that uh, plants need water, air, and soil and space to grow in order to survive. People need food and shelter and water to survive. Uh, so survive just means to stay alive. Now resources are things that are available to be used when they're needed. So we have resources around us, right? Some of the resources that we might get from nature include wood from trees, uh, plants that we use to eat, uh, coal or oil or anything that may be mined to power factories and cars and things like that. So resources, are the things that are available to you or the things that are around you that you use. Our last vocabulary word is the word threatened. Now, when something is threatened, that means that thing is being put in danger uh, of being harmed or hurt in some kind of way. So if a, if a tractor comes to build and tear down trees in the middle of a forest, the habitat of those animals is being threatened by this tractor, right? Because it may knock down the trees that those animals live in, or it might cover up the burrows or holes that they may live in if they live in, in the ground. So when something is threatened, it's in danger of getting hurt or being harmed. Now our spelling words for this week, focus again on three letter blends. So the three letter blends that we're going to be working with this week are S-C-R, which says scra, S-T-R, that says stra, T-H-R, that says thra, S-Q-U, that says squa, S-P-L, that says spla, S-P-R, that says spra, and S-T-R, that says stra. Oh, I said that twice. Let me take that one out since we already said it. Okay, so our spelling words for this week are the word scrubs, Screams, scratch, scrape, screen, spread, splash, spray, streak, strength, 
strong, squeak, three, throw, thread, rote, knife, sign, streamer, and scribble. So you can see a lot of these three-letter blends showing up usually in the very beginning of your word. Now let's get into our ELA and grammar notes for this week. So the first thing we're going to talk about or we're going to revisit uh, are prefixes and suffixes. Now prefixes and suffixes are both parts that we add onto a word. They're not a word on their own. There are a few letters that we add onto a word that changes the meaning of that base word that we're sticking them onto. Now the words prefix and suffix all come from the word affix, which means to stick or attach to. So we're going to stick something on either the beginning of our base word or we're going to stick it on to the end of our base word. And we use them again to change the meaning of that base word. So prefixes come before. So the word prefix actually has a prefix in it. The, the pre means before. Uh, just like you would see previews at the movies, which are like the little short commercials talking about other movies that are going to come out. Now, your prefixes for this week are going to be re, un, and dis. Re means again. So when you rewrite something, you're writing it again. When you rewash something, you're washing it again. Or you reread something, that means you're reading it again. Your next prefix is un, un. Un means not. So when you stick it onto the front of a word, it changes that word to mean not whatever that word is. So unhappy is not happy. Unclean is not clean. Unfair is not fair. And the last prefix we're going to talk about today is dis, D-I-S. Dis means the opposite. So it basically takes your word and it changes the meaning to be the antonym or the opposite of that word. So if you dislike something, it's the opposite of liking it. So if you dislike something, you hate it. Uh, if something disappears, that means it's gone. You can't see it anymore. Or if you are in disbelief, you can't believe. It's the opposite of being able to believe whatever it is you're seeing or hearing. Now, we also are going to discuss two very common suffixes that you guys have all used before. The first one is the suffix full, F-U-L. Now, one of the things before I move on that I want you to pay attention to is the prefixes, you have the letters and then you have the little dash after it. So it's showing you that those are coming first and they're sticking it on to the beginning of a word. For suffixes, we have the dash first and then we have the letters like dash F-U-L when I'm talking about a suffix. That dash being placed before the letters is to show you that I'm I've got the word over there first, and then I'm sticking this part onto the end of the word. So again, full F-U-L, which is not spelled like the regular wor word full that has two L's in it, means full of something. So if something is beautiful, it's full of beauty. If somebody is careful, they're full of care. If somebody feels peaceful, they're full of peace. And the next suffix is basically the opposite of full, it means without that something. So you don't have any of it. So if someone is fearless, they have no fear. If someone is penniless, uh, they don't have any money. And if you feel hopeless, you don't have any hope. Now, one of the things that I want you to pay attention to that we've talked about a few times in the past is when your base word has a consonant Y at the end of it. So a consonant letter plus the letter Y, you have to change that Y into an I before you add anything onto the end of it. So penniless, usually the word penny is spelled P-E-N-N-Y, but because it ends with an N-Y, which is a consonant letter and then that Y, we have to change that Y into an I first before we add anything onto the end of it. So that's something that I want you guys to remember, especially when you're doing your work, you are going to come across some words that do end with a consonant letter and then a Y. So make sure that you're changing it to an I before you add the suffix. Now, the next part of our notes, <clears throat> which is also going to show up in our notes next week, is about syllables. So uh, we're going to talk about the two kinds of syllables right now, which are open syllables and closed syllables. So you may not know what that means. What do you mean open and closed syllables? I thought they were just word parts. So 
word parts, syllables are word parts that have a vowel sound in them. Now, words have at least one syllable, but they can have more than one syllable and syllables can be opened or closed. So if a word has more than one syllable, it can have both opened and closed syllables in it. Now, another thing I want you to pay attention to before I describe to you what open and closed syllables are, if you have a word that has a double consonant in it, in it, so it has the same consonant twice back to back, like the word mitten, M-I-T-T-E-N, you always divide the syllable between those double letters. So one of them goes in the first syllable and the other one goes in the next syllable. So like mitten or sudden or litter or button or, uh, this is supposed to be scribbling or chatter, all of these words are, are words that have a double consonant in them. So you have over here the T, T in, in mitten or the D, D in sudden or the B, B in scribbling or the T, T over here in chatter and button. You're always going to divide in between that double letter. Now, let's talk about what open and closed syllables are. So we know syllables are parts of a word that have a vowel sound in them. A closed syllable has a consonant letter at the end of that syllable. And one way to know is that it makes a short vowel sound. So the vowels say a, ah, e, eh, e, eh, a, ah, and a. Uh. They don't make the long sound. So closed syllables end with a consonant letter and they have a short vowel sound. Open syllables are the exact opposite. They end with a vowel and they have a long vowel sound in them. So I'm going to show you some examples. Pay attention to these examples. Please come back to them and revisit them. I know your, I believe is, is closed syllables and next week's focus is open syllables, but I wanted to introduce them both and then we can talk about them a little bit more next week in our video. So remember we said closed syllables end with a consonant and open syllables end with a vowel. So the word butter, butter has two closed syllables, right? The first syllable B-U-T ends with a T and T is a consonant letter. And the second syllable T-E-R ends with an R which is also a consonant. So this one, this word has two closed syllables in it. The word sudden, also has two closed syllables because the first syllable, S-U-D, ends with a D. So that D is a consonant letter. And the second syllable, D-E-N, ends with an N, which is, a, which is also a closed syllable. So this one also has two closed syllables. Now the word chair has just one syllable in it and it ends with an R. So since it has a consonant letter at the end, it is also a closed syllable. Now, when you have the word baby, for example, B-A, A is a vowel, so that's an open syllable, and then B-Y, Y is also a vowel, so that's also an open syllable. So the word baby or the word city both have two open syllables in them because the last letter in that syllable is a vowel. And you can hear that they're making the long vowel sound. So bay says A, and then B, or C, and T. Now we have words that will have both open and closed syllables, which is totally normal. So the word pilot, for example. So if I say pilot, like the pilot of a, of a plane, P-I, I is a vowel, right? My first syllable is P-I for pi. That ends with a vowel and it makes a long vowel sound. So I know that first syllable is open, but lit is ends with a consonant letter and it says uh, it doesn't say oh, like a long vowel sound. So I know that is a closed syllable. So your biggest clue is the last letter in that syllable always. You want to look at the last letter and that will tell you right away, is it open or is it closed? Now the same things for the word silent and candy, each have an open and a closed syllable, except for candy has the closed syllable first and then the open syllable as the second one. So you can take some time to reread these and look at the examples. If you do have questions, definitely let me know and I'll help clear them up. The next part of our language arts notes is about combining sentences that have either subject nouns or they have predicate nouns. 
Now, sentences can be combined by using the word and, right? If we have two sentences that are talking about generally the same thing, we put the word and in the middle and we squish them together to make one sentence instead of repeating ourselves. So anytime you're joining sentences or you're combining sentences, you're going to say the parts that are different and you're gonna leave out the parts that repeat. And I'm going to show you an example of that. So Sarah has a cat and Ahmad has a cat. So I know the parts that are the same are my subject nouns, right, Sarah, or Sada and Ahmad. So Sada and Ahmad are my subject nouns and they both have a cat. So I don't need to say Sada has a cat and Ahmad has a cat. I can say Sada and Ahmad have cats. So you see how I had to change it a little bit when I talk about making sure that the verbs agree with each other. So has is usually used when I'm talking about one person, place, or thing. So Sada has, Omar has, he has, she has. But when I'm talking about more than one, I need to change it and use the word have. So Sada and Omar have, or they have, or we have. So anytime you're talking about plurals in the noun, so more than one noun, you don't use has anymore, you have to change it to have. So that's what we're talking about, making sure that the verbs agree. So Sada and Omar have cats. I can also say Hamza goes to school and Zahra goes to school. So again, I'm gonna take out the words that repeat and say Hamza and Zahra go to school. So same thing over here. I had to change up one of my words or more than one of my words sometimes to make sure that the sentence makes sense. I can't say Hamza and Zahra goes to school. Goes is referring again to one, a singular noun that it's talking about but when you have more than one, you're going to change it. So we go or they go. <clears throat> but if I'm talking about one, I would say he goes or she goes. So make sure you're reading your sentence out loud after you write it and that you're remembering these little rules so that your sentences make sense. <clears throat> now we can also combine sentences that have predicate nouns. So Instead of having subject nouns where the nouns are at the beginning of a sentence, we can also combine sentences that have predicate nouns where the nouns are in the predicate part of the sentence. And again, we're going to use the word and to join those sentences and leave out any words that repeat. So I can say at the pet store, we saw puppies. At the park, we saw kittens. This one I meant to change. So at the park, we saw puppies and at the park, we saw kittens. So I can say at the park, we saw puppies and kittens. So I'm putting those two sentences together. The parts that repeat are in the beginning half of my sentence. The nouns that are different are in the predicate and towards the end of my sentence. So instead of saying at the park, we saw puppies and at the park, we saw kittens, we're repeating ourselves a lot when we say that instead, we're going to take out the parts that repeat and we're going to just use the word and to join those predicate nouns. So instead of saying that, I'm going to say at the park, we saw puppies and kittens. So what I'm doing basically is I'm taking this part of my sentence and I'm going to take it out. So what would that look like? I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna cross it out and I'm going to replace it with the word and the same way I did up here. I'm going to take it and I'm going to ignore that part and I'm gonna use the word and in between to put them together. Now, another example is the seagulls ate crabs and the seagulls ate fish. So instead of having all of that repeat, I'm going to take out the part that repeats itself. And I'm gonna use the word and in between there. So the seagulls ate crabs and fish. So remember, no matter what you're doing or how you're combining it, you have to remember that a combined sentence has a subject, has a complete subject and a complete predicate for it to be a whole or correct sentence. All right, moving on. 
we are going to talk about using commas. Now, we use commas in a lot of different ways in our writing. And one of the ways that we're going to, that we use commas is when we're writing the date. So if you've ever watched your teacher write the date on the board, you notice that they'll put a comma after the day to separate the day and the year. So if I'm writing the date on the board and I say January 2nd, 2018. So I'm gonna write January 2nd, comma, 2018 or March 4th, comma, 2014. So what I'm doing is I'm putting a comma to separate the number parts in the date so that they don't get confused or meshed together. And so I can visually see, right? I can look at it and see that these are two separate parts. They're not the same part. So you're separating the day from the year. We also use commas when we're writing down an address. So we separate the city or the town from the state or the country that it's in. We separate the street address part from the city part, from the state part. And this is just so that we can keep those areas separate so that we know that we're talking about different things. So those commas help to create that separation between those things. So we recognize that each part is its own individual part. So if I say San Diego, California, I say San Diego, when I write it, I'm going to put San Diego, comma, California. So that comma shows me that the name of the city is first and the name of the state that that city is in is after the comma. Same thing when I say Denver, Colorado. So Denver, comma, Colorado. Denver is a city that's found in the state of Colorado. Now, if I'm writing a full street address, so I'm writing the address of a building or a place that I'm in and the city and the state. So I can say I am at 123 University Avenue, comma, in the city of La Mesa, comma, in the state of California. So I would write it 123 University Avenue, comma, La Mesa, comma, California. Now, the reason I'm doing that again is to separate those different parts because they're all talking about something different. The street address talks just about the street where you can find that place on the street. The city talks about just which city it's in and then the state tells you which state all of those things are in. So the same thing for my next example address. If I tell you I live on 456 Silly Street, comma, San Diego, comma, California, you know that the first part is just the street address, the second part is just the city that it's in, and the last part is just the state that we're in. <clears throat> so we're using those commas to create that separation. Now we also use commas when we are separating three or more words in a series. Now, what do I mean by series? Series is when I'm talking about a group of things, so more than two. So a series is, is a set of three or more things, and we use commas to separate the words in the series, but we do not put a comma after the third or final word in the series. So we use commas and then the word and or or before the last word in our series. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of that so you know what I'm talking about. <coughs> so if I say, if I say the farm has goats, cows, sheep, and chickens, so I have one, two, three, four words in my series. I have the word goats, cows, sheep, chickens. Those are my four words that are in my series. So I'm going to put commas after the first three words and then I'm going to use the word and before my fourth word. So if you're saying and, you're talking about a group of things. <clears throat> but if you're saying or, you're talking about a choice between things where you have to choose. So the farm has goats, comma, cows, comma, sheep, comma, and chickens. Now, if you have just three words in your series, I can say, do you want to go to the park, beach, or zoo today? So the way I would write that is I would say, do you want to go to the park, comma, beach, comma, or zoo today? So I use my two commas and the word or, to separate out my things. And again, the word or tells me that I'm making a choice between things. Now the next example says we need blue, red, black, and green markers. So commas after the first three, the word and, 
and then my fourth one. So if you have two, or sorry, if you have three words in your series, you're gonna have two commas. If you have four words in your series, you're gonna have three commas. So you're also, you're always going to have one less comma than the number of words, plus the word and or or. Do you want to run, jump, or skip at recess? I will cut, glue, and color my work. So all of these are examples of listing things out. So a series is a list. <clears throat> and we use the commas to separate the things in our list. And we use the word and or or to show if we're talking about a group or if we're talking about making a choice. Now we also use commas after the name of a person that's being spoken to. So if I'm writing a sentence and I'm talking to you, I'm going to put your name and then a comma and then put the rest of the sentence. I also do that with the words yes and no when they come at the beginning of a sentence. So I can say, Luna, can you please pick, pick a book to read to the class? So I would write Luna, comma, and then I would have the rest of the sentence. Or I can say, Mardia, do you have the markers? So I would write Mardia, comma, do you have the markers? So the comma comes after the name, after the person that I'm talking to, and then what I'm saying to them will come after that comma. It also comes after, again, like I said, yes or no. So yes, comma, the books are here, or no, I did not find the markers. So these are all different ways that we use commas in our writing. So just to recap, we use it when we're separating the day from the year, when we're writing the date. We use it when we're separating the parts of an address from each other. So the street address is separated from the city it's separated from the state or country that we're talking about. We use commas when we're separating words in a series. And we use commas after the name of someone that's being spoken to or after something that starts, after a sentence that begins with either yes or no. So let's go ahead and hop into our reading for this week. So we are going to be reading our stories from our big and small book. <clears throat> so we're going to open up our resources and we're going to open both books. We're going to open our reading and writing workshop as well as our literature anthology book. Now you guys have the hardcover copies of these books at home, but you can also pull up the online versions. Now, this week for our literature anthology, we're going to be reading a story called Whooping Cranes in Danger. So this is a story about uh, a particular kind of bird called a whooping crane and how a group came together to help help them survive. Genre, expository text. Whooping Cranes in Danger by Susan E. Goodman. Essential question. How can people help animals survive? Read about whooping cranes. Find out how a group of scientists are helping these birds survive. There are many types of heroes. Superheroes in comics catch bad guys. Astronauts risk their lives to explore space. Doctors devote their careers to finding cures for dreadful diseases. Our story has heroes, too. Scientists and their helpers are saving the whooping cranes. Whoopers need help. Long ago, whooping cranes lived all over North America. Then people started hunting them. Farmers and builders took over the marshes these birds called home. Whoopers were losing the resources they needed. By 1941, only 15 whooping cranes were left in the wild. It looked as if they could die out forever. Some people refused to let this happen. The government reserved land for these cranes to live on. Hunters could not enter this wildlife refuge. Scientists guarded this tiny flock in Texas. Seventy years later, its population has grown to 200 birds. But one flock is not enough. A disease or storm could wipe it out completely. Scientists decided to create a new flock in Wisconsin. Two groups of birds are safer than one. Without places to get food and raise families, the whooping crane could not survive. 
a tough problem. Building a new flock of whoopers is harder than it seems. These cranes are born up north, then they migrate south in fall to avoid the cold winter. In spring, they fly back north for the summer. Who says birds aren't smart? Scientists had a big problem to solve. They couldn't just grab some whoopers from the first flock to start a new one. When returning north, adult birds will only go back to the place they were born. So all members of the second flock had to be born in the new spot. How could that happen? Who would their parents be? A clever solution. Eleven eggs were about to hatch in spring of 2001. Their parents were ready to welcome these chicks to the world. Their puppet parents, that is. This puppet takes the place of this whooping crane chick's mother. Scientists had to raise the chicks, but the whoopers weren't supposed to get used to people. The birds needed to be wild to stay safe. So humans pretended to be whooping cranes. They wore white costumes to hide their faces and bodies. They wore puppets on their arms to deal with the chicks. The caretakers never spoke near the birds. They talked to the chicks by playing tapes of real whooping cranes. They also had real whoopers in the refuge. The chicks needed to know what actual grown-up whooping cranes looked like. Caretakers used the puppets to teach the chicks the same skills that real parents would. The puppets showed them where to swim and where to sleep. They even taught the chicks how to get along with other cranes. The puppets could teach most things, but they couldn't teach the chicks how to fly. Scientists used puppets to train the babies how to eat and drink and where to find the right kind of food. Stop and check. Reread. Why did the scientists wear white costumes and use puppets? Reread to find the answer. The biggest parent of them all. Pilots of ultralight planes could do the job. They put on their costumes and got to work. At first, the plane just rolled across the ground. A pilot played a special crane call, which meant, Come on, follow me. That's exactly what the chicks did. Of course, the treats given out by the pilot's puppet helped a lot. As days passed, the plane sped up. The chicks did, too. Flapping their wings helped them go faster. It also made their wings stronger. At last they ran fast enough and flapped hard enough, and up they went. Soon the cranes were flying almost every day. They had to. Fall was coming. They had to be strong enough to migrate more than 1,200 miles to Florida. The whoopers learned to follow the ultralight on the ground and in the air. They had to learn to recognize their Wisconsin home from the air because the plane would not lead them back the next spring. Operation Migration Finally the big day came. This experiment started with eleven eggs. Two chicks had gotten sick and died. One couldn't fly well and moved to a zoo. The other eight whoopers were ready to go. Two ultralights revved their engines. One would lead the birds. The other would track down cranes that strayed from the flock. The planes took off. The birds did, too. They were on their way. Planes and birds were only part of the migration. A crew drove south, too. The birds had to eat and rest each night. Scientists had chosen safe places along the way. The crew rushed ahead to set up pens for them to stay in. This ultralight plane led the whooping cranes to their winter home in Florida. The trip was hard. The cranes flew up to 95 miles on good days, only 20 on bad ones. Often rain or wind kept them from flying at all. One sad night, a giant storm ripped their pen apart. 
caretakers spent hours searching and calling for their whoopers. All were fine, except one. He had flown into a power line and died. After 48 days, the plane flew over the bird's winter home in Florida. A caretaker on the ground played the whooping crane call. The whoopers swooped in for a landing. The first part of the journey was a success. Whooping Crane Migration Wisconsin, Florida Map Key Green, Land Blue, Water This map shows where the whooping cranes flew when they migrated. A Warm Winter What was one of the first things the whoopers learned about Florida? Crabs are delicious. The shells were hard, but the meat was soft. Puppet parents helped the whoopers learn to peck them apart. At first, the crane stayed in a pen as big as a football field. It even had a pond with a fake whooper parent in it to make them feel safe. Actually, they were safer in the pond. Cranes usually sleep in the water at night. Splashing sounds warn them if a predator is nearby. In time, caretakers took the top off the pen. The cranes flew out to explore more of their new home. Caretakers hid, watching them enjoy yummy shrimp and snails. Generally, the whoopers returned to the pen at night. Sometimes they didn't. Two cranes were killed by bobcats. Now there were five. The whoopers learned to eat new foods, such as crabs, in their winter home in Florida. In spring, the birds started eating more. That was a good sign. They were storing energy for a trip north. Still, the scientists wondered, would the cranes know when to leave? Homeward bound? One day, caretakers heard radio signals. The cranes had leg bands that sent out these sounds. The whoopers were on the move. Caretakers jumped in two trucks to follow the signals. They had to hurry. The trip home would be much faster. Air has currents, just like water does. Birds ride these currents the same way that surfers ride waves. The cranes traveled more than 200 miles the very first day. They were headed north. But would they remember their route? Soon scientists had another thing to worry about. One crane left the group. A truck turned to track her. Where was she going, and why? Scientists wondered if the whoopers would know when to fly north to Wisconsin. Day by day, the cranes kept flying. Then the group of four reached Lake Michigan. They began to circle. Oh no, thought the trackers. They do not know which way to go. The whoopers kept circling around and around. After two hours, they finally turned west. They were on course. Eleven days after leaving Florida, these four cranes came in for a landing. They were very close to the pen they grew up in. What about that last crane? She ended up visiting a flock of sandhill cranes for a while. Sandhill cranes are relatives of whooping cranes. Two weeks later, she came back home to the refuge. The number of whooping cranes is beginning to grow again. A New Beginning This first migration was finished, but the whooping crane's recovery had just begun. The next year, these five cranes flew south by themselves. The ultralights were busy leading 16 new chicks. The planes still lead migrations each fall, but now whooping crane parents are leading their own chicks down south. Some of these chicks have grown up enough to have babies of their own. The whooping crane is still threatened. It remains one of America's most endangered birds. But scientists are hopeful. Luckily, the flock keeps getting bigger. All right, that takes us to the end of our first story about whooping cranes. We're going to go through a short story, another one about manatees. Help the Manatees 
People in Florida are worried. The manatees are in trouble. Hundreds of these supersized marine mammals are dying every year. The population dropped from 3,000 to 2,500 in just 12 months. What caused the problem? People. Why are manatees in trouble? Manatees make their home in warm, shallow water. They live in Florida rivers and bays and in the ocean. They eat weeds and grasses that grow in water. Manatees don't have many enemies because they are so large. After all, they're related to elephants. However, people have threatened their habitat. Many people live in Florida now. Lots of people take vacations there, too. More people than ever are using the manatees' habitat. Places to see manatees in Florida, Tallahassee, Florida, Miami. Manatees can be seen throughout Florida. They live along the coast and in rivers, springs, and bays. Manatees can be 10 feet long and weigh up to 1,200 pounds. Key, Black Square, places to see manatees. Red Star, State Capitol. Red Dot, City. What hurts the manatees? People raise power boats in shallow waters where manatees live. Some boaters crash into manatees and hurt them. Fishing hooks and nets hurt manatees, too. Swimmers also like to use the warm waters where manatees live. That can drive the creatures away. Taking Action The Save the Manatee Club has taken action to help manatees. The group educates people about these gentle giants. They teach kids and grown-ups how to keep the manatees safe and healthy. They rescue injured manatees. They work to change laws to help manatees. The club gives away banners and signs. These remind boaters to go slow around manatees. The group also teaches people to use less water. Manatees need resources such as clean water. Now people in Florida are more careful when they use the manatee's habitat. Manatees have a better chance to survive. They can thank their friends in the Save the Manatee Club. Slow, please. Manatees below. Signs like this teach people how to protect manatees. All right, let's go into our readers and writers workshop. So again, we're going to hop into unit two, week four, and read our stories in our reading and writing workshop. <clears throat> so we're still talking about animals and we're going to be talking about survival this week. And the story we're going to read is called Kids to the Rescue. Genre, expository. Kids to the Rescue, Olivia and Carter Reese, founders of One More Generation. What a mess. There was dark, gooey oil everywhere. It slid across the water. It coated rocks and sand. It made swimming hard for sharks and dolphins. The oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico was making animals sick and helpless. Two kids from a small town in Georgia watched the news. They saw pictures of sea turtles coated with oil. They watched animals struggle to move. As a result, they decided it was time to do something. The animals in the Gulf needed two superheroes to help them. Olivia and Carter to the rescue. Meet Olivia and Carter Reese. They started a group that works to save animals. Olivia was seven years old and Carter, her brother, was eight and a half. They named their group One More Generation. They want animals to be around for kids in the future. Olivia and Carter believe everyone can make a difference. They are sending an important message. Their message is that everyone can help animals. Olivia and Carter watched oil spread for miles across the Gulf. More and more animals were getting sick. The Kemp's Ridley turtle was one of them. 
there are only a few thousand left in the world. They are endangered, and their population is getting smaller and smaller. The oil threatened to ruin their homes and their habitat. Olivia and Carter Reese learned how oil harms Kemp's Ridley turtles. Oil spoils everything. Olivia and Carter learned that the female turtles were swimming across the Gulf to Mexico. They were going to lay eggs on the beaches there. But the thick oil destroyed the resources the turtles need to live. The harmful oil covered the sand. It made it hard for them to swim. Sea turtles survive by eating seaweed, jellyfish, and small sea animals. The oil spill spoiled their food, too. Without food, the turtles die. This female turtle is clean. Saving the Sea Turtles Olivia and Carter recognized how big the problem was. The turtles needed help. First they made a thoughtful plan. Then they called a rescue group in New Orleans. They found out that the workers needed useful cleaning supplies and wipes. Next, the kids asked friends, relatives, and people in their town to help. They told them how the donations would help remove oil from the turtles. Olivia and Carter collected supplies for four months. They rode with their parents to New Orleans. They carried the supplies with them. Then the kids watched caretakers clean hundreds of sea turtles. With the help of many people, the turtles were soon spotless. Olivia and Carter's plan worked. It was a huge success. Going to New Orleans. Map key. Star. City. Dashes. Route. Arkansas. Mississippi. Alabama. Fayetteville. Georgia. South Carolina. Atlantic Ocean. Louisiana. New Orleans. Gulf of Mexico. Florida. Keeping Busy Olivia and Carter work with many other groups to help animals all over the world. They give talks at museums and schools. They ask community leaders to support laws that help animals. They help rescue animals in danger. Olivia and Carter are truly superheroes to endangered animals. With their help, many animals will survive for one more generation. Ways you can help animals. Protect animal nests. Pick up trash at parks and wild places. Keep water clean. Stop using plastic bags. Carter and his mom unpack supplies in New Orleans. All right, let's get into the rest of our uh, notes and information for language arts this week. Our comprehension strategy is again to reread. So remember, rereading means to read something again. And that helps you to pick up any facts or information that you may have missed the first time you read it, or to help you get a clear understanding of something that may have been confusing to you when you read it the first time. <clears throat> so when you reread, you're giving yourself a chance to see the information again and to look for context clues to help you understand anything that was confusing. Reread. Stop and think about the text as you read. Are there new facts and ideas? Do they make sense? Reread to make sure you understand. Find text evidence. Do you understand why an oil spill is harmful to animals? Go back and reread page 151. What a mess! There was dark, gooey oil everywhere. It slid across the water. It coated rocks and sand. It made swimming hard for sharks and dolphins. The oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico was making animals sick and helpless. Two kids from a small town in Georgia watched the news. They saw pictures of sea turtles coated with oil. They watched animals struggle to move. As a result, they decided it was time to do something. The animals in the Gulf needed two superheroes to help them.
I read that oil made it hard for sharks and dolphins to swim. Sea turtles were coated with oil. They struggled to move. These details help me understand why oil is harmful to animals. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about is our comprehension skill. And our comprehension skill this week is identifying the author's point of view. So the author's point of view is what the author thinks or feels about a specific subject. So they're telling you basically their point of view or their opinion, and then they're giving uh, supporting details throughout the reading or throughout the thing that they wrote for you to read that will support their idea. So they're telling you, this is what I think, and these are all of the reasons why I think it. Author's point of view. The author often has an opinion or point of view about a topic. Look for opinions and details that show how the author feels. Compare your point of view with the author's. Find text evidence. How does the author feel about Olivia and Carter's work with animals? I can reread and look for details that tell me what the author thinks. Graphic organizer. Details. Olivia and Carter recognize that turtles need help. Olivia and Carter collected supplies to help the turtles. Their plan was a huge success. Details from the text help you figure out how the author feels. All right, let's talk a little bit about our genre. So we've talked about expository text before, and the stories that we've been reading today are also expository text. So they're giving us information or facts about a topic. Expository text. Kids to the Rescue is an expository text. Expository text gives facts and information about a topic, has headings and sidebars, includes text features such as maps, Find text evidence. I can tell that Kids to the Rescue is nonfiction. It gives facts and information about a group that helps animals. It also has a sidebar and a map. Text features. Sidebar. A sidebar gives more information about a topic. Map. A map is a picture of an area. It shows cities, roads, and rivers. And we're going to talk a little bit more about suffixes. So remember we said that suffixes are a group of letters that are added to the end of a word that change the meaning of that word. Suffixes. A suffix is a word part added to the end of a word. It changes the word's meaning. The suffix full means full of. The suffix less means having no or without. Find text evidence. In Kids to the Rescue, I see this sentence. The harmful oil covered the sand. The word harmful has the suffix full. I know that the suffix full means full of. The word harmful must mean full of harm. The harmful oil covered the sand. All right, that takes us to the end of our language arts notes for Unit 2, Week 4. I hope you have an amazing week, and if you have any questions, definitely let me know. Otherwise, take care. Have a great day, third grade. Bye-bye.